welcome to Nerd Night East Bay. I'm Rick Karnowski, one of the co-bosses of Nerd Night East Bay. Uh, we are taking over the world, or at least the Bay Area. We will now have our fourth Bay Area event. This one promises to be more regular, which is awesome. And I'll have uh, Scott, who's one of the co-bosses of Nerd Night North Bay, tell you about that in a bit. But first, I wanted to welcome you, everyone to the show. Uh, say hi to everyone in the streaming theater over in Theater 2. We're, we're glad that you could make it today. Thought it wasn't going to happen. Uh, first of all, you should go check out that table right there where Mana is waving her hands. If you already have an Oakland Public Library card, you should get one of these nice lilac colored uh, flyers that tell you how you can learn more about each of the three talks tonight. If you don't have a library card, shame on you, and you can get one here. Uh, I'm really excited about the lineup tonight. We're going to have a talk on Bitcoin. We're going to have a talk on Bicep 2 and Cosmic Inflation. And we're going to have the talk from David Lang about Open ROV. But before you hear any of that, I want to make sure that you hear about free beer. So here's Scott. <laughs> like the best intro to get you guys to pay attention to me, so thank you, Rick. That was great. Uh, so yeah, we're starting Nerd Night in the North Bay. Uh, we think it'll be great. Nerd Night is, I think, 75 cities, 100 cities, a lot. There's a lot of cities that are out there. So we're, we're way up in the North Bay. We're up in Novato, okay? So I know what you're thinking. Why the fuck are you in Novato? Well, so Novato actually offers a lot of great advantages. Such as, hey, Novato is, is close to other cities. <laughs> That's Novato's best selling point. You can get from other places to Novato pretty easily. So, Petaluma is really close. Anyone here from Petaluma? You know why? Because it's really far to get down here, but it's close to get to Novato. So, you can get you know? uh, San Rafael, also really close. You just jump in your car. Anyone here from San Rafael? And I've proven my point once again. So, uh, yeah, it's really easy to get down there. Also, uh, we have a great venue, uh, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but it's at Hot Monk. Uh, we'll talk about the advantages of Hot Monk as well and why you should go there. We're actually going to be the... Rick is so much taller than me. So, uh, we're actually going to be the first Tuesday of every month. So that means, if you think about it, that you could go to a nerd night three times a week every single month and get some sort of nerd merit badge if you wanted. So you should totally come out and try that as well. Uh, so, a couple things we need you to do to get on Nerd Night North Bay. Uh, so you should go to north.bay.nerdnight.com. You should get in our mailing list. I'll talk about a gigantic advantage to our mailing list in just a moment. Also, eh, Facebook kind of sucks, but you should totally also go to our Facebook page as well and add it. Facebook loves to change the rules. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. But uh, you can also find us on Twitter. Uh, so follow us on Twitter. I have three followers. I'm pretty excited about this. That was that was actually that was weird because five people cheered. <laughs> so two of them cheered but didn't follow me. Jerks. All right. So uh, yeah, you should totally go to these sites um, and for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, join our Facebook group, even though Facebook sucks, because we do put our event announcements on there. You should oh, you should get on the Nerd Baby Network. You should join the Facebook group. Let's start. You should join the Facebook group. Uh, we will put our event announcements up there. It's also a great way to get links and stuff like that. We will not spam you on Facebook. We will not send more than one or two notifications a month, I swear to God. Even better, you should definitely get on the Nerd Night North Bay mailing list. So, Nerd Night North Bay offers some great things for you. First, we have great speakers, just like Rick has here. Um, we also have a great venue. There are 15 beers on tap at all time of Hot Month. There are actually lots of good beers. And also, finally, they are going to pair a special rare beer for every Nerd Night event. So if you're one of those guys that likes to check in on Untapped or whatever, get that rare beer and brag to your friends, you should totally go to North Bay Nerd Night. They will have one of those beers. Finally, oh, here it comes. Here's the big surprise, the reveal. The reason you should get on the Facebook group and on the mailing list is because free beer. <laughs> we're going to buy your beer. So if you're, you know, no one likes to get spam emails. I totally get it. We ignore it. I delete it. I don't even read it. So here's what we're going to do. If you get on our mailing list, we're actually in the event going to announce from our mailing list someone that gets free beer at that event. And when I say free beer, I mean unlimited free beer up to four beers. This is amazing. <laughs> Fuck you. That's a lot of beers, all right? Where the fuck out of Novato? You have to drive back, remember? <laughs> um, also, 
sorry. That was my thing right there. Uh, also, uh, if you're on the Facebook group, fine, fine, Facebook, you win. We will also pick someone from our Facebook group for free beer as well. So if you're on the Facebook group, that's a chance to win. If you're on the mailing list, that's a chance to win. Theoretically, I guess, you could be you could win twice in the same event. We'll give you free beer for life. That is not true. We won't even tell you you won both. But we will give you free beer that event. So please, absolutely, especially go to the mailing list. We will send you two event uh, invites for an entire month. No more than that. I swear to God, please do it. And you just might win free beer. Free beer. Free beer. Come <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're going to have uh, a talk on Bitcoin tonight by Jeremy Rue. Uh, so that's the hip, new, awesome alternative currency, okay? And alternative currency is something that comes up all the time in human history. So while Bitcoin is very popular right now, it's worth, what, $500 a Bitcoin a share? I don't know. I haven't seen the talk yet. Um, but there's actually a, a drive in human history to come up with other ways to make money and to have money. So you think of... You know, money is, is dollar dollar bills, y'all. And it's not just cash. It's actually lots of different things can become currency. What is currency? Dog coin. <laughs> Cur yeah, that too. Thanks. Dog, uh, dog coin. Currency is basically anything that has an accepted cultural value. In other words, this thing is worth this much in this culture, and I can exchange it for other things. So what I thought I'd do is take you on a completely ridiculous but factual tour, going back from this point in history, Bitcoin popular, back through history for what has been alternative currencies and if we're lucky try to figure out what those alternative currencies are worth like are worth now so if you invested in things in 6000 BC what would that be worth now okay so first thing uh, first alternative currency these are true stories so 2011 uh, Tide became a gigantic alternative currency so uh, police in Baltimore like the wire Police in Baltimore noticed that they were getting a lot of calls for stolen Tide bottles from grocery stores and, and, and drug stores. And it turned out that some of these companies were actually losing $15,000 a month in stolen Tide bottles. That's crazy, right? So why was it? It turned out that Tide had become an alternative street currency. So what people were doing is they were actually stealing Tide bottles. They were drug addicts. They were stealing Tide bottles. And they could actually trade a Tide bottle for $10 of Cracker Pop. Okay? And again, remember that that cracker pot of $10 already has a huge markup, like a 95, you're a drug dealer, you're a businessman, so you're, you're marking it way up. So you could trade a Tide bottle for $10 of cracker pot. Okay? Ah! But then the drug dealers that got the Tide could sell it on the black market for $5. So what did they just do? They just totally laundered money. <laughs> Pardon the pun, that was accidental. <laughs> The worst part is that was accidental. I didn't actually even plan that till now. So you could actually trade drug money for Tide, and then you could sell Tide on the black market for five real dollars. Okay. Now, why? Well, who would they sell to? Well, it turns out that Tide is really. Ex you guys use Tide is expensive. It's twenty dollars a bottle. The next one is like ten dollars. It's crazy. So you could actually sell your five dollar thing at Tide. Um, on the wholesale black market to less reputable stores, and they could resell it for $20. So they made a bunch of money, the drug dealer made money, and the drug addicts got drugs. It was an alternative currency that worked really well until the police shut it down. Sometimes if you don't have money, you can just decide that you have money and print it. Uh, so this is <laughs> the Republic of Sealand. So uh, after World War II, or during World War II, they actually built a bunch of offshore uh, bases to look for Germans, and then World War II ended, and eventually we stopped looking for Germans. And so we just left the bases out there. And so an art colony actually went and lived, I shocked him with my German. So an art colony actually went out and lived on one of these bases way out off the coast of, uh, of, of uh, London. And so uh, that art colony actually got kicked out by something called the Bates family, which declared themselves emperor and ruler of the new country of Sealand, okay? So Sealand, oh, that went fine for a couple years, and then they realized that they needed things like goods and services and money, so they didn't have any money, so they printed money. They basically decided, you know what, we now have Sealand dollars. Keeping in mind, this is a thing out in the middle of the ocean, there's no trade with Sealand. But they printed Sealand dollars. Ah, but what was their exchange rate? We just learned the, the exchange rate on the black market was $5 for Tide, they cleverly set a Sealand dollar being worth one U.S. dollar, no matter what a U.S. dollar was worth worldwide. 
Uh, you have to actually question how committed they were to the idea of Sealand dollars because they would do all their business, they would ask for money in US dollars, but they would only pay in Sealand dollars. Which kind of makes you think maybe they weren't convinced they were going to be around. The weird part is they are still around. You can actually go to their webpage. You can become Sealand royalty if you want, right? You can actually sign it. costs like 25 US dollars to become a duke or a duchess of Sealand. So this. Oh god, if you lived in San Francisco for more than 20 minutes, you've heard the story of Emperor Norton 55 times. I'm, yeah. And his family's in the audience, that's awesome. Um, I'm not going to tell the whole story, I'll tell you the really quick version of the story. The quick version of the story is he's a man who moved to San Francisco, he had lots of money, he lost all that money on a failed rice importation scheme, he went crazy, he left San Francisco, he came back to San Francisco, he claimed himself Emperor of the United States of America. <laughs> Luckily, he had a lot of friends and a lot of people that humored crazy people, and so they basically accepted what became known as the Emperor Norton Dollar. He basically printed money and decided that that was what the currency of the United States was in 1959. This got tricky for me. I'm like, what in the hell is the exchange rate for Norton Dollars? Because unfortunately, he's been dead for like 130 years. So it's not clear what the exchange rate is. So I, I looked it up. You can go to eBay and you can buy an Emperor Norton 50 cent piece for 9.99 US dollars. So if you do the math there, that means that one Norton dollar, oops, sorry. That means that one Norton dollar is worth about 20 US dollars. Okay, so you have another exchange rate. Finally, last one. We're skipping about, what, 6,000 years of history? Uh, last thing, so the biggest, the longest running currency in history is the cow. Uh, cattle, for a long time, has been an accepted form of value. You had to basically have cattle to be rich, right? And there's lots of different reasons for that. But if you go back to the Bible, I mean, there's lots of references to two things. If you're rich, you have slaves, and if you're rich, you have cattle, right? As you can see from all these different Bible verses, just so no one gives me too much credit for being pious, I totally Googled Bible verses with cows in them. I had no idea what that stuff was. But, so how much is a cow worth? Well, that's actually a tricky question. Because cows, like, you have to feed them, you have to water them, you have to, I don't know, cow, I don't know, you, you walk them, you walk a cow. Well, let you, you graze them. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> Grazing, I assume, is expensive. So if you have a cow, what's the quickest value you can get out of that cow? So I wondered, well, how much meat is in a cow? And so first I'm like, I looked up the price of ground beef, but it, it's gross, you can't just grind up a whole cow and be like, ground beef. <laughs> so luckily someone had actually done this experiment for me. Uh, they bought one cow, and they figured out exactly how much of each type of meat they got out of this cow. So in other words, they got, going way up there, three tenderloins, five short ribs, they got three three pound rump roasts, and then I went, this is what I do with my Sunday people, please appreciate this. I literally looked up the value of every single goddamn type of meat in a cow, all right? They had each of these things, that's how much it costs per pound, so the value of the cow, multiplying it out, there's $2,421.14 of different kinds of meat in a cow if you got a cow as currency and immediately murdered it for meat, I'm not a vegetarian. So. Okay, so, what does that mean in the end? In the end, if you think about it, that means one cow is equal to 2,421 Sealand dollars is equal to 121 Norton dollars is equal to 484 black market Tide bottles. Let's talk about Bitcoin for the love of God. Thank you so much. getting set up, I did want to note that there's an email sign-up list on the librarian table along with a few posters if you like this month's design. Here's Jeremy. So my name is Jeremy Rue, and I'm a lecturer at the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. I teach coding classes for journalists, which is kind of a strange thing, but um, I got into encryption mostly because of this, uh, we do a lot of investigative reporting, and uh, in this last year we've been really getting into uh, you know, digital security and these topics, and, uh, and I did a, a talk here. Um, uh, one of these night talks, one of these five-minute night talks, and Rick saw it, and I, I know maybe a handful of people may have, may have seen it, and I, I apologize, I reprised some of the slides for that. That talk was five minutes long, this one's 20 minutes, so you get an extra 15 minutes of really 
heart-stopping and crypto <laughs> content, and so I hope it's uh, it's not too much uh, 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 similar to what I did earlier. So uh, this this little guy right here. So there's a very vibrant Bitcoin community out there, um, and this guy's kind of a, kind of the meme of the, the community. Whenever the, the price of Bitcoin goes up real high, people get real excited. The guy's to the moon, and, and people. And you'll understand why if you look to kind of how much uh, the meteoric rise of Bitcoin over the over the last just couple of years. It's pretty interesting. But really, this talk is not so much about Bitcoin as it is about the underlying technology, which I find fascinating. Bitcoin, I don't I don't know what's going to happen with it. I'm not much of an evangelist myself. Um, I'm just really fascinated by the, the technology behind it that makes it possible. I think it's, a, it's, it's just an extraordinary piece. And, and to really understand it, we kind of have to talk a little bit about encryption itself. Uh, and so I'm just going to have a couple slides here, a few slides here, to talk a little bit of a quick brief primer on what is encryption, what does that mean, how does it work, and then we're going to go ahead and segue into a little bit of Bitcoin. I'm going to talk about why I think this is so fascinating. So encryption uh, started... Um, as early as like Julius Caesar, as they call it Caesar's cipher, which is essentially um, kind of a substitution. You take, you have a message, and, and, and you substitute, you know, an E for an A, or uh, or, a, or B or F or a C, uh, kind of like you these little Annie Orphan decoder rings that we're all familiar <laughs> with on the, the Christmas story. Uh, and so you take a message like you know Hello World, and you have some kind of key which could be a decoder ring, and uh, you end up with this kind of scrambled message that nobody knows except for people who have the key. And so the person you're sending the message to, they have the same key, presumably, and then they will be able to decode the message and take it back into Hello World. And so the, the process of doing this is often a lot more fun than the actual message itself, as Christmas Story has told us, <laughs> if you guys if you remember the, the movie. But this basic type of encryption is called symmetric encryption. And symmetric encryption is basically the process of taking a message, encoding it, and scrambling it up, and then the other person de you know, uh, decoding it at the other end, uh, which is great. It's still used quite a bit. Um, but it doesn't, it, there's some issues with it online. The problem is, is you have to have this key and you have to give this key to another person. And that's, that's great if you can physically hand it to them in person, but um, online, you, you, it, 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 it's hard to kind of send a key out in the open, you know, via email or, or somehow uh, getting it to the other party without it being encrypted itself. So they came up with this, this, this ingenious method. This is called public key encryption. And public key encryption is a really fascinating idea about taking a message and scrambling it up uh, and so that you can essentially communicate with a complete stranger. And how it works is you have a couple of people, let's say Alice and Bob, uh, and they each have two keys. So they have, they have a, a public key and a private key. And the private key is something they keep secret. It's almost like a password. And these, these, there's a lot of advanced math that goes in behind this that I'm not going to really get into. But essentially what happens is uh, Bob and Alice, they have this public key and they, they say post it to their Twitter profile or they post it online or on the website, here's my key. And what happens is say if Alice wants to send Bob a message, she basically, all she needs is a piece of software and his public key and she can scramble and create a message that only he can decode. So basically he takes this message, so, so Alice takes this message like, hello world, um, runs it through a software program, the software program says, who do you want to encrypt this for? She goes, well, here's, here's, here's Bob's uh, private, uh, public key, and ends up with this, this is a real encrypted message right here, uh, and, uh, and sends it to him, and he's the only one that can actually uh, decode this and reverse it, and, and she can't even, after it's encrypted, she can't even, she knows what the message says, but there's no way to take, to, to cryptographically take this and to re return it back to its original uh, form uh, without the private key. Uh, and this is, I, I found this really fascinating. We use these, this is a, 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 a type of software called PGP, which is being used a lot for email and, and, and all sorts of different uh, uh, purposes. Um, this is a quick video I, I, I wanted to just show. It. This is real, it's real short, it's, it's, it's less than a minute, about uh, this process of using public keys and private keys for something called a key exchange or a key handshake. Uh, I'll just play it. Two people who have never met agree on a secret shared key without letting Eve, who is always listening, also obtain a copy. In 1976, Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman devised an amazing trick to do this. First, let's explore how this trick is done using colors. How could Alice and Bob agree on a secret color without Eve finding it out? The trick is based on two facts. One, it's easy to mix two colors together to make a third color. 
and 2. Given a mixed color, it's hard to reverse it in order to find the exact original colors. This is the basis for a lock. Easy in one direction, hard in the reverse direction. This is known as a one-way function. Now, Alice keeps her private color and sends her mixture to Bob. And Bob keeps his private color and sends his mixture to Alice. Now the heart of the trick. Alice and Bob add their private colors to the other person's mixture and arrive at a shared secret color. Notice how Eve is unable to determine this exact color since she needs one of the private colors to do so. And that is the trick. And that is the trick. And so I just, uh, I find that completely fascinating. There's all of these different tools and all of these different ways that a lot of computer scientists have found to, to devise ways to communicate. And, to, and essentially what it comes down to is a way to communicate and to, to, to um, it, know if people are who they are. You know, you post a comment, you're in a chat room, you're, whatever you might be doing, it's just this kind of this wild, wild west place. Um, and one of the things that encryption does is it kind of creates a, 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 a mechanism for trust. And, a, and the underlying technology for Bitcoin is, is very much about creating trust in a place where, where trust really doesn't exist very well uh, because anybody can be anybody on the internet. And, uh, and so how do you know this person is really who they say they are? How do you know, uh, how do you transfer information in a way that, that it can be uh, validated and, and that can be uh, uh, tamper free? Um, there's another a uh, aspect of, of encryption that's real important, it's called digital signing. And that's essentially using the same software, um, you can actually prove that a piece of content is free. So what you would do is you would have, let's say Alice wrote a message, say I wrote this sentence and she wanted to, add this little piece of code down here, just some, some cryptographic code, uh, she could sign that and anybody can validate that because they would know her, her public key and they could say, okay, you know what? She's the only person that could have written a sentence and if, if it, even one character of that sentence is, is modified, this wouldn't match up and it wouldn't validate. And it, developers have been doing this for years. They've been signing you know, code and, 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 and programs that they write. So when they create a, a piece of software, they want to make sure that there's no viruses in it or malware. So people will, will have to have a digital signature sometimes. Um, but uh, people have found other uses for this. They found other ways that they could take this mechanism uh, and, and, uh, uh, and apply it to other uses. Um, one of the other things that a lot of develop, uh, people do is they sign other people's public keys. Uh, and, and this is uh, a way because, so let's say I have a public key, uh, and Rick has, let's say, has a public key, but how do I know that's really his public key? I don't know if this really belongs to him. So one of the things we could do is we can meet in person and, and I can sign it, and so that way other people would know, hey, I vouch for this person. Uh, and this used to be real popular in a lot of these uh, crypto kind of, crypto uh, nerd communities, you know, and, and people would have these parties, key signing parties, uh, not to be confused with a key party. Um, so just be very I really like to see the uh, the person that showed up to the wrong party on that one. And I don't think it's their the cryptographic key of how they did that. Um, so anyways, uh, so what, where, where this all leads to is this ingenious uh, 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 piece of software uh, that was uh, created in about 2008, 2009. Um, and essentially what started, there's, there's a lot of uh, really interesting apocryphal sometimes uh, uh, stories about how it was created. Uh, a person had written a, a white paper, essentially a research paper, just proposing this, this idea and, and explaining how a system like Bitcoin would work. A bunch of developers got together, created this system. And what's brilliant about it is it, it, it just, it sort of, it's decentralized. It runs itself. It's on millions of computers all around the world. Uh, and there's no there's there's no entity that runs it. It just it just kind of exists, and uh, uh, and so it's it's really interesting uh, in how it works. And it uses two central technologies. It uses encryption. And it uses something called peer-to-peer -peer technology uh, to to really to operate. To, and essentially, if you think about um, anything that's online, 
uh, how do you how do you really know like music, uh, digital music can be copied, anything can be copied and duplicated. You know, piracy is a big issue. So how could money, how could something tangible ever exist online, and how could you know that somebody who ever had some kind of e-cash, some kind of digital cash equivalent, could, could double spend it, and could spend it again and again and copy it? Um, how could you create something that exists? and that you know it exists once, and then once you spend it, you don't have it anymore. You basically don't own it anymore because you've transferred it to someone else. Well, through those two technologies, and it was really born out of a way to, to sort of eliminate these guys, because right now, if you wanted to transfer money, let's say cash is great, cash, cash works, right? I want to buy something, I hand someone a, a $20 bill, they give me some, some kind of merchandise for that. Uh, if you want to do that online, you're always going to be relying on some kind of third party. Uh, to facilitate that transaction. And basically they, what they do is, like, it's like IOUs, right? You use PayPal, you use some kind of Western Union, and, and these entities, they charge fees for these things. They also demand a lot of uh, private information. You know, Western Union, they want your social security number and things like that. Um, and so this is sort of what the community around Bitcoin is really interested in. It's kind of a very libertarian community because they really want to sort of create a system of e-cash and a way to transfer goods and services to other people around the world without having to rely on a third party. You can just do it directly. Um, and then it's, uh, it was pretty much worth nothing, you know, pennies for most of the, the early life of, of, of Bitcoin. And then suddenly around 2011, just a lot of more people started taking it more seriously. There was a day in, in 2011 where it hit $32 of Bitcoin. And people were just astounded that it could ever be worth that much uh, physical cash. That Because the thing about Bitcoin is there's only a finite amount that could ever exist in the system. Right now there's about, 12, I think, 12 million Bitcoins in existence. Uh, th there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins ever minted. Uh, and, the, and the way the software is written, and there'll never be more than that. And so it's, it's a scarcity. And so there's people that want this. They want it, you know, for various reasons. Some people are investors, and they think it's the price is going to go up. There's other people want it to spend. Other, uh, a lot of the developing world wants it because it's a great way to get around a lot of uh, 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 transfer, uh, money transfers, Western Union fees, things like that. It's really growing in a lot of developing countries. Um, and so uh, throughout 2012, and all of a sudden there was this huge spike right in the beginning of 2013 where it hit $200. Uh, and then late last year it just shot up um, because of some different different things going on all the way up to $1,300. It's right at about $500. So if you wanted a Bitcoin right now, you would have to pay about $500 uh, to obtain one. Um, and this is, this is and what you're buying essentially is just digital code. You're buying a number essentially. And that's all you would get. You'd get this little secret number. And if anybody else figured that out, that number, they could you know, theoretically steal it. They could take it from you. Um, and so this, there's this funny little story that uh, this guy, or in the early days of Bitcoin, bought a pizza for 10,000 Bitcoin back when it was worth pennies. Uh, and that pizza today, you know, would be worth you know, $7 million. And so every, on March, uh, or May 22nd, they celebrate this pizza. You know, people in the Bitcoin community, they buy a pizza every March 22nd. They go out and buy big pizzas with Bitcoin, you know, to celebrate this interesting story of this person who uh, he had written about it because he thought, I want to buy, buy something with Bitcoin. Uh, and back then it was just, you know, it was this equivalent of, of pennies. Uh, today, you know, uh, Overstock.com accepts a new egg. You, Dish Network you now accepts payments in Bitcoin. You can pay your cable with your satellite bill. Expedia, you can buy travel. Uh, cheap Air, you can buy F air flights. Flights, Cheap Air will take it as flights. One hand flowers, which a lot of people thought was interesting because it's, you know, you don't want a credit card transaction to tip off your so we have another uh, Tesla, of course, Elon Musk, you know, so he wanted to be the first where you could basically uh, uh, buy a car, you know, he wanted to basically the, the bragging rights, there's going to be a, a, a NCAA football bowl uh, uh, later this uh, fall, the uh, St. Petersburg Bitcoin Bowl, it's where one of the vendors of Bitcoin is, uh, is sponsoring that, paid a lot of money. Uh, they, they make POS systems for like brick and mortar establishments, or you, if you're like a business owner, you can buy this little thing and accept Bitcoin, uh, your establishment. So, uh, and I, I left off, I was showing this to a colleague of mine, he's like, he left off Dell, Dell Computers also accepts it now. Um, and here's a, a map of places around the world, brick and mortar places that accept it. Interestingly, it's not that big here in the Bay Area. There's a few places in San Francisco, like a ramen place, and there's a cupcake place in the Mission that, that takes Bitcoin. But it's not, it's, it's really, it's bigger in a lot of other countries and a lot of other places. Ohio, there's some business, a group of business owners 
started to create something called Bitcoin Alley, where like all these businesses along the street accept it. And, um, I had a, a, a trip that I had to do in Baltimore, and I went to this bar called Bad Decisions. And thanks. <laughs> Good. And so, um, so that's a lot of fun. So the end user doesn't really need to know that much about encryption. You just download. There's an iPhone app. There's an Android app that you can just download, and you can just buy some Bitcoin with, with real money, with, with um, dollars, and you can start just spending it if there's a place that accepts it. Um, this is sort of what the physical manifestation of a Bitcoin looks like. And notice, there's there's two keys. There's a public key, and there's a private key. And the way it works is, if you want to accept, if you want to receive money, your public key could be public, you can post it on, some people post it on their website saying, hey, send me money, send me a tip if you like what I wrote, and some people in like forums will write, write down their, their their public address, you might see this long string of numbers you may have seen below someone's like signature on the forum, and that's a way just to tip, you can say, you know, it's a really big tipping thing, because you know, it's a real quick way to send something 25 cents or 50 cents, US equivalent of Bitcoin. Um, it's interesting, this address right here is worth $298 million. If you somehow could figure out the private key to this address right here, I mean, that's, think about of all the bank heists, all of the incredible things people have done over the years uh, to steal money, and, and essentially there's a number out there worth a lot of money, and there's a whole bunch of addresses, mostly from people in the early days of Bitcoin that amassed you know, tens of thousands of Bitcoins um, that are now worth very many, many, many millions of dollars. Uh, and other other entities, gambling rings, things like that. But, um, it's it's Bitcoin has gotten real big, it's especially in a lot of illicit ways. Think about it because of the sort of pseudo anonymous way that you can transfer money really quickly around the world. So it's 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 used in a lot of uh, various ways as well. So let's say Bob wants to send Alice a, a Bitcoin. So basically, what he's going to do is he's going to have a piece of Bitcoin software. You call the usually called a wallet. So Bitcoin, a wallet, you can download it from Mac, PC, smartphones, whatever. Uh, and he's going to use this private key and Alice's public key, and he's going to transfer some form of money, like one Bitcoin, let's say, you know, those are some, some money. And, uh, and it's going to be recorded, it's going to be broadcast to the Bitcoin network, which is a public network. This right here is not live live, but this was live when I recorded it. And essentially, you can see all of the Bitcoin transactions in real time. So you can see all of the addresses of anybody who's sending anybody else bitcoins around the world. So it's pseudo-anonymous is what they call it because we don't know who owns these addresses, but we can look them up, we can see how much they're worth, we can see every transaction. That's what keeps the system honest in a way is because it's all public. It's all, it's like a, a copy of the public ledger of bitcoin is kept uh, on computers all over the world, on, on millions of computers. And so why would anybody run this Bitcoin software on their computer, just let it sit there? Well, it turns out that's how new Bitcoins are minted. In fact, they call it a process called mining. So you set up your computer, you run a program, you just let it sit there, it does nothing, just sits there. And essentially, it earns money, it earns Bitcoins for you. And so they've incentivized the process of just keeping the network going. Um, this is what a miner used to look like. I had a miner similar to this about a year ago. Um, and it used to be just this little thing that you could sit there and it just like mine some Bitcoin and it'd get real hot, so you'd have to have a fan on it. Uh, nowadays, because it's been in this gold rush, basically these are just, it's not even worth the electricity to run, to run something like this anymore, because this is what Bitcoin mining looks like now. <laughs> there's huge warehouses, there's one big one, there's a, a news report, this, this gentleman, had, they've done a news report on him in Washington, because apparently in Washington, electricity is really cheap. Uh, and he was boasting how he makes, you know, $7 million a month. And, uh, basically just essentially processing these transactions and uh, and really what it's doing is it's processing the transaction. It's, it's, it's an interesting, and the main innovation with Bitcoin is something called the blockchain. This is the underlying, and that's real, it's real complex and unfortunately I don't have a lot of time to to go into all of the very specifics of how it works, but essentially what's happening is all of these miners are, it's kind of a, it's kind of a game, it's like a lottery system and they're forming these transactions into these blocks and these segments of, 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 of transactions. So about every 10 minutes or so, a block is formed, which basically, you know, this block has 300 transactions that was that were made at this period of time. Um, and they kind of fight over it. And it's just this kind of, this tree that just starts to form. And maybe some other miners create a block up there and this guy creates a block over here. And, and then it turns out that the longest branch always wins out. So if this little, once you get to block five, uh, it turns out it wins off, and so this branch of the block gets folded into the original, and it's, I wish there was some way to visualize, I, I couldn't find a great animation that really explained it, but it's this fascinating way of basically kind of like a tug of war of all of these different computers sort of agreeing. It's, it's, it's kind of this a, a trust through consensus. Because there's so many computers, it's, it's really hard to game the system. If you want to game the system and create some Bitcoin out of thin air or double spend a Bitcoin, it's really hard to do because you'd have to hack millions of computers around the world. 
Uh, and it just, it just, it, 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 would, it would be nearly impossible to do. So it's just great. The system that created this sense of trust, and it's uh, 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 certainly a, a, a leap in, in terms of computer science and, and, the, and the different uh, problems that it solves. There's a lot of people talking about, wow, they did this with currency. What else could they do this with? And I don't know, I don't know what, what the future of Bitcoin itself is going to be, but I do believe that this technology has really you know, gotten a lot of people's attention. Uh, and so people are talking about all sorts of ways that you could sort of prove through encryption, through something like a blockchain, all sorts of different aspects of life on the digital world. So things, you know, they work great in physical form. A lot of this stuff, you know, what's, what's wrong with birth and death certificates? You know, it's fine, it works. Right? Well, what if it? You know, what if? What if? When, when you digitize stuff, how do you know something that's digi digitized? It really is what it is. Anybody can go in and just change it, hack the system. Uh, any of this stuff, once it's in one, ones and zeros, it's kind of susceptible. It's, it's um, and so a technology like the block, like the Bitcoin blockchain, can be used to to essentially validate this. And because it's through consensus, through it's because it's millions of computers, it could be once a a block in the blockchain is accepted and verified, it's impermanent. And they can they call it permanent and it's impossible to change. And so this idea that you could use a lot of things on patents or copyrights or vote, and by a lot, there's people have written, there's a lot of grad students have written some papers on voting and how we could really change the voting system to create it so it's verifiable, so that people can validate it, can check it, it can stay pseudo-private. So you, and then that way, you know, you know, it could be in a digital form where it can't be changed. So it's like this digital equivalent of, of, of doing on paper. So. Anyhow, um, I guess that's it. Uh, this is a t-shirt that somebody's selling. I thought it would be a good closer. Uh, so I, uh, I was talking to Rick. Rick said I should do something fun. Um, so I actually, I, I didn't know if anybody has questions. I actually, I printed out some, I just like, you know, some, some Bitcoin like paper wallets. Each of these is worth .002 Bitcoins, which is about one US dollar today. Could be worth double that or half that, who knows. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, interesting, there's the public address and then there's a little tamper-proof sticker here to hide the, the private address and so you basically download the software on your phone, you kill it, you scan it in and, and there's instructions on the back. So, I don't know, I, I, I should I hand it out to people who ask questions? Yeah. yeah. So, okay, any questions I can answer right now? Yeah. So if you want to buy Bitcoin, actually, like, if you, you know, want to be totally cash and anonymous, you know, how do you, where do you go buy some Bitcoin? So, with cash. yes, okay, so how, where do you buy Bitcoin? If you want to be completely anonymous, you want to, and, then, and you look on Craigslist, search Bitcoin for Craigslist, it's interesting because a lot of people sell stuff now uh, for Bitcoin, a lot of people like to buy it because they don't like to give out your credit card number. Um, the, the places, there's a website called Local Bitcoins, which essentially, uh, there's a lot of companies now that, that allow you to trade, there's, the big one is Coinbase, which is based in San Francisco, uh, and you can sign up a Coinbase account and you can connect your bank account, but because of money laundering issues, every Everybody wants a lot of information from you, and that scares a lot of people away initially, uh, because they, you know, they want to make sure that you're legit and that you're not laundering money. Local bitcoins is just sort of a, a, a like a, a, a meeting site that just hooks you up with somebody so that you can meet them in person, and somebody somebody's going to just sell you something with cash, and so you arrange, you know, a public place, a cafe, and you, and you go and you give them twenty bucks or a hundred dollars, whatever you want to buy, and then they would send you Bitcoin, and you check your phone, and you wait until it's validated, and then you, okay, I, I, I got it. It's it's definitely it's it's in the blockchain, and there's no way they could ever take it back once they send it to you and it's been validated. And you're all right, thank you, and that's it. And then now you have Bitcoin anonymously. Nobody knows that you have this and who you got it from, I suppose. And there's actually people who've done this. They've they've tried to see how much they can do completely anonymously. And, and a lot of authorities, the FBI is really kind of into Bitcoin now because of all of the various reasons that they that it was, and, and they've gotten very savvy. They, because of the blockchain, you can trace back every Bitcoin transaction all the way back to the beginning. So they're trying to create whole segments, a whole divisions on about Bitcoin and how they can learn about how to match people with specific addresses and trace back where the you know the, tra the transactions have gone and so so it's this kind of this uh, race between the authorities and the people that are using it for those reasons. All right, oh, I choose. Why don't we just start over here and I'll look at it. 
So the tax, uh, how, how traditional companies tax evade with Bitcoin taxes are interesting because the IRS realized very quickly that people were becoming millionaires on this thing you know, overnight. Um, and so the, the, the IRS had to decide what they wanted to do with it. Everybody was hoping they'd treat it like a currency because if it's a currency, it's not, it's not that big a deal. The IRS said no, they're treating it like property, just like anything else. So it's just like if you bought a car and the car appreciated or if some kind of device or like a, 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 a token, you know, a collectible. If you bought a collectible and it appreciated and you sold it, you made a ton of money on it, then you'd have to pay taxes on it. And so, but the thing is, is when the IRS came with the, down with this ruling, saying we're going to treat Bitcoin like a, a prop piece of property, and you have to declare all your earnings when, when you transfer. So if you just had Bitcoin, and you don't have to pay taxes, but as soon as you convert it back to U.S. dollars, if you made money, you have to pay taxes on how much you made or lost. Um, but they they don't really have a great system. They're just now getting a system in place of how they even even they don't you know this is so new they have no idea how to audit it or authorize or even how to note it like how do people are asking like how do I even write it down in my form? There's no form for this, and so um, so they've had to catch play catch up on that too. It's good as well. Yeah. Okay. There. Time frame? Are they looking for Bitcoin to be useful for? Because I know that there is a lot of work done kind of on the cutting edge of computing and math to pretty much break every encryption algorithm out there. Yeah. And ultimately if modern computing and things like that get you know off the ground then it's all of the no, it was, yes, uh, no. So one of the so one of the interesting things is uh, the question. Yeah, the question was is uh, you know cryptography will be broken eventually you know with quantum computers and you know won't all this be moot in a certain uh, time frame? Turns out in the white paper that the, the original the gentleman who invented Bitcoin is the, is the entity we don't really know is a Satoshi Nakamoto and, and addressed this issue and the cryptographic uh, uh, strength uh, in, in Bitcoin. Uh, is not quite uh, uh, um, uh, quantum computer proof, but basically made a system in place, put a proposal in place to, to upgrade it when that should happen. And so Bitcoins can be upgraded pretty quickly um, from its current bit size to one that is so long. The right, so right now, you know, I, sh I said, if you could somehow guess the private key of that one address, you'd get $200 million. Well, it turns out that number, the number of guesses you would have to make and there's so many guesses in there, there's actually more guesses to figure out that private key of the Bitcoin than there are atoms in the universe. And it's such an immense number. No, every computer that could be working toward this problem would never solve it. Um, but a quantum computer, maybe. So when he figured out, he said, you know what, if we just doubled it, uh, the, 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 the cryptographic strength of this, it would, it would, it could be more. And there's a lot of debate around that. But um, there's, there's, there. People are thinking about this. You know, it's kind of a, it's a race. You know, people say, well, if the computers get stronger, so will the algorithms. And and, the, and, and Edward Snowden, that was a big thing when he basically said that the NSA. That's the one thing that protected you was cryptography, was was encryption. That's the one thing the NSA really couldn't crack. NSA cracks everything else around encryption, but the actual. The actual uh, encryption itself is actually pretty sound. He says they'll just hack your computer and see what you're typing before you encrypt it, or the person who's decrypting on the other end. But he says the encryption itself, that's that's pretty sound. And, and even the NSA is, is really afraid of encryption for that reason. So. Let's take three more questions. Three more questions. Why don't we do one over here? Yes. Um, so most currency has some sort of innate value. That's yes. how it's worth so much money, but you can eat it. Yeah. Um, tie, wash your clothes. So what is the innate value of it? What's the innate value of Bitcoin? This is a fascinating, in fact, Alan Greenspan, when somebody asked him about that, and he said that is the exact same thing. He said, you know, what's, what, what is the, what is this, what does it give you? It's just that you're buying a number. And that's true, and I guess all currency is sort of what worth we associate with it. And I think what they were able to accomplish with Bitcoin was to create something that was unique enough um, and trustworthy enough that people could associate something. You know, a digital song, you know, that you could just share around, and then what's what's that's not really worth much. That you know, Napster has proved that, and other and other you know services since then is that it's just you know so easy to get. You know, why would you pay money other than just being very honest and, and paying money for it? Um, but Bitcoin was a, they were able to accomplish a way to create something unique in a digital form that you could actually pay money and feel like I you know have this and other people cannot get to this without physically seeing the, the number. You know what I mean? 
Um, but there isn't, yeah. So it's just whatever we whatever we associate with it. Just like you know, a dollar, like a fiat currency. What what makes a twenty dollar? It's not worth the paper it's printed on. I mean, or, uh, I mean, it is, but it's not. You know, it's just a piece of the intrinsic value is just a piece of paper. So um, yeah. Uh, uh, right here. Perfect. I can see your public key. The most about me, it's the, it's the same public key no matter what transaction you do. So it's about the NSA just tracking everybody's public key and seeing and tracking your purchases. So if everybody can see every transaction and you see your public key, what's to prevent someone like the NSA just tracking everything? In fact, there's there's websites that already do that, that track every transaction. The problem is, is there's so many millions of transactions um, and there are people, there's like already devices in play where people do these things called tumblers where they'll send them to intermediate addresses and other addresses and other addresses and they'll just try to mix coins together. They'll take one Bitcoin, because Bitcoins can be split to like trillions of a, of a Bitcoin by, by six zeros and you can just split it and then recombine it. And, uh, so there's ways to sort of fool the system and you would ultimately need a human to figure out. So there's there's some ways around that, but you're on it, you're right. I mean, it's it, the whole system works because it's very transparent. Um, and so it's it's what they call pseudo anonymous. It's not designed to be 100% anonymous. Um, so, yeah. uh, last question. Last question. Oh, you're right here. So I'm just curious, what's to prevent someone from shorting the system by overloading the network? That's oh, overloading the network. Interesting. So if I did. If I set up two accounts and did like five million super complex transactions, yeah, you know, and then shorted the currency at the same time, would like, that? So the question was, could you short the currency and overload the network and make, in fact, a lot of people suspect things like that have already gone on because you see these little flash crashes all the time. Um, you can see, you know, there's exchanges. It's, uh, Bitcoin is actually on the Bloomberg terminal. You can actually see it it's along with all the other, you know, New York Stock Exchange and everything. And, um, and, and you can see the buy orders. Like if you go to these specific exchanges, like Coinbase in San Francisco or others, you can see the buy orders. And sometimes there was one where somebody accidentally put in a really, you know, high buy order. And it was just shot up, and you can tell like people were trying to make quick, a quick buck on that by buying and selling Bitcoin, and, and that probably happens a lot. Uh, the network overloading the network is hard to do. Um, I'm sure people have tried it. Uh, everybody, I mean, this system has been really like put to the test. So many hackers, really smart people, have tried to hack it, and they have succeeded several times in the early days of Bitcoin. They've hacked it and they've destroyed it, and they've had to fix it. Uh, and that's a big concern. And, and one of the things that I think Bitcoin is the issue with it is I sound like I'm an evangelist, but I'm very, I'm very, I, I, th I don't think anybody here should really invest more than they can afford to lose because um, one of the things is it's grown a little, little quick, <laughs> pretty quickly recently. It's, it's grown more quickly than it probably should has, uh, and should have. And um, one of the one of the lead developers of the software. He often says, you know, I'm, I get scared even touching the code now because so much, there's like a market cap of $7 billion and huge corporations now that depend on this currency. If they like screw it up <laughs> through like a version update, you know, that, that means a lot of really major issues. And so if they ever, you know, the things in the early days when somebody found an exploit or hacked it, you know, they were able to fix it and that wasn't that much damage. Uh, nowadays, it, a lot of things can happen when, when, when they find issues with it. And it's, it's been very sound for like the last year and a lot of people have tried People, this is like a favorite tool of like computer science grad students. They love to try to prove that you can double spend it and you can try to hack the system and you know as an experiment. And people try to hack it every way possible. So, all right. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks again to Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy will be in theater two answering questions for more about Bitcoins, I assume. Bitcoin encryption. Yeah, so if you have additional questions, you can head over there. Uh, if you don't, uh, you can head over to the librarian's table right there, get a library card, get a reading list, sign up on our email list, whatever. We're going to have like a 15 minute break. Uh, the next talk on cosmology requires a little bit of setup. So, see you then.
very many ways I could introduce the next talk. Uh, first of all, we had a talk on Bitcoin, so there are a number of like inflation jokes I could make. But Roger and I went to school together, and so that opens up a whole new realm of territory. But we've been warned against uh, getting too graphic and showing like injuries, so I could show like embarrassing, embarrassing pictures of Roger drinking, but there are just as embarrassing pictures of me not drinking. Um, so that that's no good. Uh, Roger's not going to talk to you about the detectors he actually makes, even though they're awesome. So I thought about talking to you about that, um, but I wanted to sort of climb it up a bit in our next style. And so uh, I'm going to talk to you about the South Pole. I didn't know which South Pole to talk to you about. I could talk to you about the South Pole that uh, one of Roger's experiments is at. So that's bicep two. And that's quite close to the true geographic South Pole, which actually shifts a lot. So they have to uh, pay machinists to redesign this each year and replace it. Uh, and there is, in fact, like a nice actual pole. He, you'll notice a lack of like. Uh, Santa hat, you'll also notice that he's actually wearing clothes. Thank God. Uh, apparently it's a tradition to like go hot tubbing and then uh, go here completely naked and that's a bad idea. I could uh, talk to you about the magnetic south pole, but I'd have to like show you pictures of like penguins, you know, like March of the Penguins, because right now it's actually in the Antarctic Ocean, um, well away from the geographic south pole. Um, so instead, I'll, I'll, I'll show you like something that's kind of cool, which is like the point furthest away from any of the Antarctic Sea. So it's out in the middle of nowhere, and out in the middle of the nowhere, they have a bust of Stalin. Uh, why? I don't know. Um, and with that, uh, here's Roger. <laughs> the intro and for the invitation to speak. Uh, in case you missed it, I'm Roger O'Brien from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory down at Caltech and I'll be speaking on behalf of the BICEP2 team this evening. This is a photograph of BICEP2 here. Uh, it uh, should come as no surprise given the name that it's actually an upgrade to the original BICEP telescope. Uh, both of them live in the same location, about a mile north of the geographic South Pole, which is around there in this photo. Uh, our team has used these instruments and others to form maps of the cosmic microwave background. And back in March, our team made a very bold announcement, which is that within our maps, we had found evidence of gravitational waves likely produced during the Big Bang itself. So if you're a physicist, you'll agree that this is indeed a bold claim, whereas everyone else might be wondering, what the hell are we talking about? <laughs> in particular, you may want to know, what's this cosmic microwave background I speak of? Uh, what's a gravitational wave and how did the Big Bang make them? What specifically did we see in our maps? Why Antarctica? Isn't it cold and hard to get to? And lastly, you might be wondering, uh, or thinking, this all sounds outlandish, is it possible we just messed the whole thing up? <laughs> so starting with the first of these, what's the microwave background? Uh, in brief, this is light that's left over from the Big Bang, uh, but context is important here, and I'll remind you that one of the greatest discoveries in the history of science was the realization that our universe is expanding, the space between the galaxies is stretching, thus carrying them apart, and it's popular to analogize this to the surface of an inflating balloon. These purple spots here represent galaxies, and indeed, they're carried apart by the stretching space between. Uh, it's we know that something like this has got to be going on because we can compare the light from the distant galaxies to that in our own. And, uh, and things uh, look similar except the light from the distant galaxies are longer in wavelength, even though likely they are emitted with similar properties. But that makes sense too because after all, uh, the light from the distant galaxies must traverse the stretching space and has this wavelength stretched out little by little becoming redder and redder over time. Right? But if you take seriously this idea of an evolving dynamic universe, it begs the question, what did it look like early on? If you had a video of our universe and you wound it backwards, what would you see? Or what would happen if you let the, the air out of this metaphorical balloon? And the answer, of course, is that the galaxies would converge back together. Matter would get denser and denser. This light would get shorter and shorter in wavelength, bluer and bluer, and thus hotter and hotter. And this is the sort of extrapolation scientists once went through to begin speculating our universe had begun in a hot, early, dense state, or, or a hot Big Bang. Uh, if you were looking at it right after the Big Bang, 14 billion years ago, uh, the universe would have looked completely alien. 
Now, you wouldn't have even found atoms. It would have been so damn hot. It would have been nothing but ionized matter. Protons and electrons held ionized by this very hot light. But even back then, the universe was expanding, stretching out the wavelength and cooling that light little by little. And this 400,000 year point was of note because that's when things were finally cool enough for atoms to form for the very first time. And when they did, the light that had been ricocheting about and holding matter ionized, it was abruptly released and could finally move freely in a straight line. They began sailing across the universe. We can still see it in our telescopes 14 billion years later. And you might wonder, how do you see something 14 billion years after the fact? And the answer is that uh, it's come from very far away. It takes time for it to get here. It's, it's sort of like when you look at the sun, you're seeing it not as it is right now, but as it was eight minutes ago when the light was released. Or when you look at, at Alpha Centauri, the nearest star, uh, that's four light years away, thus the image is four years old. So as you look through a telescope further and further away, you're effectively looking further and further backwards in time. But there's a limit to how far you can see, because after all, the universe is finite in age. It's 14 billion years old. You can't even see all of that at the very beginning, because the universe was filled with this, this hot ionized matter that scatters light pretty effectively. You want to switch over, Rick, to the... Right, so you can look across the room here, and you can... Woo! You got a gun? You look across the room here, and you can see this tank of water that I brought. You can even see sort of through the tank of water here. Uh, it's it's uh, basically transparent to light. It goes in a straight line. Uh, so it's a pretty good analogy to the uh, modern universe. But the early universe would make more sense if we pour some milk in here, and then we stir the thing up, and it gets kind of cloudy, right? So you can't see through it so easily anymore. right? You can see just fine looking across the room up to it, but up into here, uh, you can't see much anymore because most of the light you're seeing is actually scattering off of this front surface. And we call this the surface elast scattering. Right? But the difference between this analogy and practice is that the actual surface elast scattering surrounds us on all sides. We stand at a, the center of a sphere. That's our observable universe. And the light from the scattering surface has endured 14 billion years of expansion. It has this wavelength stretched all the way out into the uh, microwave range. Hence the name cosmic microwave background. Are you in business? Let's tell you more. Nope. Swing and a miss. <laughs> All right. All right, so this light is very dim. It's about three degrees above absolute zero, uh, but very uniform at temperature, up to 10 parts per million. Uh, so if you had a map of the entire sky full of flat, it would look like this, pretty featureless. And in fact, the classic question in cosmology is, why is this so uniform? Right? How is it that opposite sides of the observable universe know to be the same temperature when the light from them is just now reaching here at the midway point? Right? They never should have been in contact. Right? So the answer to this riddle is actually related to where the gravitational waves come from. Uh, we think the universe went through a, a bit of a, a growth spurt at the beginning, a very rapid period of expansion that we call inflation. Uh, it's the bang behind the Big Bang. And if you look it up on Wikipedia, you'll find this really goofy cartoon. So this apparently is supposed to be raisin bread. Uh, while it rises, shown to double its dimensions over the course of a second, which I think would scare the living shit out of any chef. But that happened. Right? But that's actually an understatement of what we think happened early on. We think in the first trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, that distance scale should have increased by at least 27 orders of magnitude. And this means that adjacent regions of space would have been pulled apart at speeds far in excess of light. So in principle, you could have had a small volume before the event that came to the same temperature, and then it got blown up to something bigger than we can currently see. That's our folklore for why the microwave background is so uniform. It also explains where the galaxies may have come from, because a, uh, a different way of spacing it stretches like this. This is a gravitational well. Matter can fall into these dimples to form things like stars and galaxies. On a very microscopic and fine scale, we think that these should be able to pop into and out of existence. We call these quantum fluctuations. And conceptually, it might look like this. Bumps and wiggles very rapidly coming into and out of existence, but they're very faint. So faint, you have no chance in hell of seeing in a laboratory setting. It's likely going on in the room right now. You wouldn't know it. But that's why inflation is so cool, because when it kicks in in the early universe, it stretches these out to cosmic scales and freezes them into place, as we're showing here. After they're frozen, matter can fall in and form slightly underdense regions, and in the early ionized universe, slightly hot and cold regions. Most importantly, this is going on across the surface of mass scattering. Right? So if you do what the Planck satellite did, did recently, it's a, it's a space-borne satellite that's doing measurements of the sort, if you subtract away the average temperature, but they've done it many before them, then you would see these tens of microkelvin variations about that average. Right? These spots will one day go on to form things like stars and galaxies. And uh, in many ways, this is a baby photo of our universe. For the universe, an 80-year-old man or woman, this would have been taken in the first few hours of its life. Now, a different way that spacing is stretched is like this. This is a gravitational wave coming out of the screen towards you guys. It stretches on one direction and then a little bit later on the other, back and forth. You'd see this in practice if you had a ring of masses. Right? As it comes through, these are really just traces along for the ride, but they get squeezed in one direction and then back in the other. 
right? So, you know, th there's only some evidence that these things may exist, although our result is one piece of that evidence. These also get amplified from quantum to cosmic scales by inflation. And so why do we think we've seen these things? And the answer is that we are less interested in the uh, intensity of those spots in that map or our version, and rather more in the polarization. That is, we wanted to know at each point in the sky whether the electric fields from that light were going, say, up and down, or perhaps left and right. right? These are distinct states of light, but uh, ones that, um, that uh, the human eye has not evolved to see. But fortunately, we can build tools to see these things and uh, let that race reflect and respond. Okay, so, this is a polarizing grid. It has little microscopic wires. So if I put it in this orientation, it's letting through horizontally polarized light. And then if I take another one of these and I put it in the vertical direction, it's going to block everything but vertical. And of course, together, it looks dark because we're bucking out both states. And if I rotate this then this way, you can see light getting through because now they're both horizontal. You get some through. So you can see as I go back and forth here, this is a very real effect, albeit one that we can't see on our own. But this is a meaningful thing for us to, uh, to study on the sky because uh, those spots you saw on that map were actually sound waves rushing through the early ionized universe, uh, once tr uh, triggered by those gravitational wells for inflation. Now, it's complicated if you have many different waves rushing across the sky, but if you have just one direction and wavelength, it's simple. So this is going from left to right. It has alternating high and low pressure planes here, and in the early ionized universe, hot and cold. And if you consider an electron right at the surface, the last scattering is just about to get sucked into an atom. Before it does, it sees intense light coming in from above and below, but dim from left and right. Uh, therefore, it gets shaken more in one to, whoops. Uh, more in one direction than the other. Uh, and so it's going to scatter light towards us that's, uh, that's polarized, or partially polarized at least. We can simulate this in the tank here by turning on the set of lights. Come up. Ooh. Looks nice in person. <laughs> Man, okay. Well, anyway, so this, this bright spot in the center, uh, this is going to be difficult to see in the back of the room, uh, is, uh, is meant to represent one of the intense planes in the sound wave. And if I then take the grid and put it in front, right, as I rotate this back and forth, you can see it goes from dim to bright. Is it even evident? Which is demonstrating, sir? Bright to less bright. Yeah, bright to less bright. We should just go back to the videos I, I took. But, um, right, so this is showing that it's partially polarized, but most importantly, it's got to be polarized parallel or perpendicular to the left-right direction the wave would have been going. And if you were to look at that through a mirror, that would un be unchanged. It doesn't change when you look at it through a mirror. Uh, we call this Eden symmetry. Uh, and the point is that the sound waves only know how to produce those sort of patterns on the sky. Okay. And if you have many of them rushing across the sky, they're going to reflect that underlying property. They're going to produce characteristic circular and asterisk looking patterns here. Uh, and uh, and uh, I stress this point because the gravitation waves also get in the act. They stretch and compress space. But if it's filled with ionized matter, then, uh, then it's going to heat and cool, as I'm not showing on a color scale here. And if you put or if you had an electron right in the middle, it's therefore going to see hot and cold in opposite directions. So it's just like the sound wave before. It gets shaken more one way than the other. And so it's going to send polarized light towards you. The difference here between this and the sound wave is you could there will have these going along these diagonal directions. And so if you had a bunch of these zipping across the sky, you get a more complicated set of uh, polarization patterns. Right, so if we go back to the, uh, the tank here, and I turn on this set of lights instead. Oops, right here. Turn off this. Right, so now here, this is uh, representing, uh, this is representing uh, essentially uh, compressed space on some diagonal axis. And so as the wave is going from left to right, then you would see essentially dim along a diagonal and, uh, and then bright along the other diagonal. So bright and then dim. Right, the point here is that if you looked at this through a mirror now, Right, this would then flip to the other diagonal. In other words, it looks dark here, but if you imagine flipping this thing, it will go dark in the other way. We call that odd symmetry when it goes back and forth between two different alternatives. Can we flip back? Right, so, so what you wind up seeing if it's going from left to right is hot and cold on opposite axes, and so therefore the electron gets shaken in some diagonal direction. Right, but the point is when you look at it through a mirror, it goes to the other diagonal. And when you have many of these waves rushing across the sky, then you wind up having characteristic patterns here that look like pinwheels 
right? They reflect that, that odd symmetry. The one on the left when mirrored becomes the one on the right, and vice versa. So this is the telltale sign of a gravitational wave here. Uh, and, uh, and, and so we call these B modes, whereas these even symmetry E modes should trace the gravitational wells from inflation. Uh, these themselves look unchanged when you look at them through a mirror. Right, so I want you to memorize these shapes. We're going to look at our maps in a second. Uh, they're going to, uh, it's not going to be too hard. We're going to play a game of where's Waldo. Uh, but you, uh, the one thing you need to know in addition here is how large these features are on the sky. And the answer is about two degrees, which is humongous. Right, the full moon is like a half degree on the sky. Uh, so any idiot can see the full moon. You don't need a lot of resolving power to see this, but what you do need is sensitivity because you're looking for something very dim. You're looking for an excess of one photon in one direction versus the other for every 50 million to enter the camera. Right, so that's the strategy here, sensitivity over resolution. This is the team. Uh, it's been a privilege working with this gang. Uh, I've never uh, witnessed so many really smart people working with such intensity and focus towards one really awesome goal. Uh, and it's been one of the greatest thrills of my life to play a role in this process. Now, Bicep 2 uh, mapped the sky for three years, it's now retired, whereas Keck Array here is five copies of Bicep 2, and it's plugging away as we speak. When people hear the name Keck, they often think of a telescope uh, out in Hawaii. We chose a less hospitable location, about a mile north of the geographic South Pole. Right, so uh, why Antarctica? Uh, isn't it cold and hard to get to? And I, I ask these rhetorical questions not to complain. This used to be more difficult. So in the bad old days, you would sail down there in one of these wooden boats, and perhaps it would get caught in the ice and crushed, leaving you stranded for years, as happened to Shackleton and his men. This is Atkinson here. Uh, he was the first to get to the South Pole. He got there by uh, sled and dog across the continent. Uh, he beat this glum crew of Englishmen here by a couple months. Right? They infamously chose to use ponies instead of dogs. Uh, they all died on the way back out. So this used to be more difficult right now. Now we fly. We have it easy. It's a long flight to Australia, but it beats sailing. Uh, we connect there, typically to a flight into New Zealand, to Christchurch, where this, uh, this coach waits to whisk us away. This is uh, run by the U.S. National Guard. It's pretty rough and ready. So you sit on these nets for hours as you fly south from Christchurch right, to McMurdo, which is on the coast of Antarctica. Uh, this is the largest base on the continent. It's really just a, a layover for us. You switch to another flight, you then fly across the Transantarctic Mountains here into the South Pole. So it looks like this when you're flying in flat, featureless, pretty boring. Uh, here's a different vantage point on the ground. This is the, uh, the Keck uh, Array Telescope. You're looking south. This is the base where one sleeps about a half mile off. That's immediately adjacent to the South Pole. If you turn around and look north, uh, you would see this. This is the Dark Sector Laboratory. This housed BICEP 2 for three years and will soon house BICEP uh, 3. This is a South Pole telescope. And I don't from people from up at UC Berkeley work on this thing, um, but it's optimized for a different set of measurements. This is one of the best places in the world to do the science. There is suburb infrastructural support from the NSF's Office of Polar Programs. Uh, there is, uh, uh, it's one of the, the driest places on the planet. Technically, this is a high desert. You're standing on two miles of ice here. That's how thick the ice cap is. That's what, what's what melting into our oceans now. Uh, and, uh, and it's so damn cold there that what water, water, water resists just freezes out of the air. It's very dry, uh, and, and which is important because our water can absorb and reinvent microwaves. That's how your microwave ever works. Uh, last I'll point out that the sun rises once a year and then sets once a year, uh, at six months apart. And so you have a very still and stable atmosphere to peer through. It's not being churned up by daily rising and setting of the sun. Now the downside of that, of course, is once the sun sets, uh, it becomes stupid cold there. Uh, last week it was negative 90 Fahrenheit. Uh, and uh, I know this because some, some Yehu did his ice bucket challenge down there. Uh, <laughs> And so it's too cold to land plane, so there's intrepid souls who are marooned there for eight months at a time, maintaining these sort of instruments. They do get to enjoy nice skies like this, though. So on an hourly basis, the sky does this. This is the uh, moon, actually, on a long exposure time during the winter. It's moving parallel to the horizon, whereas up here, it would go perpendicular, right? <laughs> this is important because the field that we map on about 1% of the sky just goes in a circle overhead. It never sets. It's above the horizon 24-7. 365 days a year, so we never have to stop mapping. We can engage what we refer to as relentless observing. These are the five tech cameras having at it. Each of these slews here takes about a minute, so this is sped up. It takes uh, over a day to map out our field, but once done, uh, we just do it again, over and over and over again for, for years. Right? We average these maps together to average down the noise and look for signals beneath. Right, so this thing isn't too large. Here are some people for uh, reference and for scale. Right? So if you had Superman vision, you could see inside this thing and you'd see cameras like this, about the size of a person, just enough to get the job done without going overboard. And they contain a pair of lenses that image the sky into a focal plane that we've stuffed full of sensors. Uh, they're basically thermal sensors. Uh, we're looking at thermal radiation. We put the whole thing inside of a cryostat. It's a glorified thermos. We want to chill the optics down so they're not glowing in front of the thermal sensors. So here are the detectors, the sensors, they look like this. We make them in-house at JPL. 
Uh, each pixel contains an antenna that routes the two polarizations to two separate superconducting detectors that look like this. The, uh, uh, this thing is pretty large, it's about a centimeter on a side, the size of your thumb, so you only get a few hundred per focal plane. Uh, that pales compared to your modern digital camera with a megapixel array. But then again, the wavelength we're looking at is several thousand times longer, so this actually works out to be pretty good. It's difficult to make a camera that's more sensitive than this, and we have five or six of them on the ground. Uh, nonetheless, it takes years to make a map that looks like this. Now, this is the 1% of the sky that we observed. Uh, each of these lines here is telling you the direction of dominant polarization, whereas the length tells you the excess power in one direction versus the other. And you can just see by eye that it's dominated by circles, and by asterisk patterns. In other words, what I was describing earlier as the, the emo pattern. In fact, if I filter this for nothing but E, it looks almost unchanged. So that's E. I'll go back and forth here, total and E. You can see subtle changes. And what that means, of course, is that the, uh, the B power is, uh, is subtle uh, compared to that. Uh, but we can just change the length scale, and now you see this pinwheel pattern popping out at you. Uh, I'll stress that this is fairly uniform across the field. There's apatization around the edge that's a result of how we make our maps. That's not physical. It varies at this sort of degree scale here, uh, and uh, which you'd expect from inflation. And last I'll point out, this is not just noise, it's above the noise floor of the camera. Here are the two side by side. We got E above and B below on different color scales, mind you. Uh, the, uh, the E sigma, I should stress, has been seen before by other teams, albeit not this high fidelity, but there's a general agreement that this comes from the gravitational wells from inflation via those sound waves. Uh, what's new here is the B mode map. No one's ever made a map quite like this before. Um, so I know a number of you in the audience were also at Caltech, and you'll be amused to know that the Mark Kamenkowski there, around the time we were there, was anticipating that such a signal might exist. Other people were too. And people have been trying to make it ever since. And interpreted cosmologically, this should trace the gravitational well, sorry, waves from inflation. In fact, you can even see the ratio and the power between them, right, by the color scales here. There's like a five to one ratio. And once you've established that ratio, then you can calculate how hot the universe was when it inflated. And the answer is damn hot, 100,000 trillion trillion degrees, which is similar to what's known as the grand unification temperature. The four fundamental forces here only appear different because we live in a cold universe, three colors on an average. But the idea is that if you witnessed the universe at temperatures that prevailed right after the Big Bang, they would have looked like different aspects of the same thing. And those accelerate experiments that you occasionally hear about, they have demonstrated that the uh, middle two here, the weak force in red that triggers radioactive decay, and the electromagnetic force in blue, where right, they act identically at temperatures 100 billion times hotter than what we experience on a daily basis. The discovery of the Higgs boson was the last piece of that puzzle. We like to think that our measurement may someday prove to be the first piece of the next, which is the relationship between these middle two and the strong force that binds the atomic nuclei together. And it certainly calls for great wonder that inflation appears to have occurred at similar temperatures. Inflation also predicts a multiverse. That is, the inflation fields themselves undergo these quantum fluctuations. So maybe in some distant part of the universe that we can't see too far away, maybe it fluctuated so far upwards that it continues to inflate today. Uh, perhaps other reasons, it fluctuated downward and ended early. So these different multiverses would have radically different properties. Uh, this, is, uh, this is unsettling to some people philosophically. Apparently, uh, their worry is that a theory that predicts everything, therefore predicts nothing, and it's inspired competing models, <laughs> such as this uh, cyclic ekperiodic model, championed by this handsome devil here, Paul Steinhardt out of Princeton. And, uh, and his thinking is that our universe undergoes trillion years of expansion, and then re-collapse into a big crunch. And his goal was to explain the early conditions of our cycle, with physics that may be driving more exotic cosmological behavior today. And the common explanation occurs through the magic of string theory. This is a string-inspired model. Now, I'm not a string theorist, so I can't explain this to you. Uh, we don't have Paul Steinar here to explain it to us. But I did find the next best thing to Steinhardt on YouTube. Some new concepts. It's really exciting. Can you actually aid a robotic uh, universe? Have you heard about this? It, it, say it again. It, 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 it's very difficult to say. Robotic <laughs> universe. Wow. That's amazing yeah. that you're reading that. Well, the model, see, the model we have now, Conan, is based on the idea that our Big Bang universe was created from the collision of two three dimensional worlds moving along a hidden extra dimension. But conceptually, <laughs> you can think of <laughs> There is no inflation or rapid change happening at all. The approach to collision takes place very slowly over an exceedingly long period of time. It's quite fascinating that the rapid change and very slow change can produce nearly the same effects. The difference results in one distinctive observational prediction. The inflationary cosmology predicts a spectrum of gravitational waves that may be detectable in the cosmic microwave background. The erotic model, however, predicts no gravitational waves effects should be observable in the cosmic microwave background. And I'm just so relieved by this. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Stephen Hawking calls in and compliments Jim Carrey on his genius performance. And, 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 and you, you might have missed it while they were yucking it up. That the crucial point here is that Steinhardt had gone out of his way to make a model that avoids the multiverse, but it involves gradual changes, and that has no mechanism to produce the sort of gravitational waves that we may have observed with, uh, with Bicep 2. So if this result holds up, it puts serious pressure on that model. It lets us say truly fundamental and profound things about the nature of our universe. And it lets us speculate on its ultimate fate. Will it expand forever? Will it recollapse into the fire so it was uh, forged in? Right. That's what I meant by bold claims when I started out. Sufficiently bold that uh, so the concept is real. When we went public. It hit the top of the New York Times. Uh, of course, as anyone who's known this sort of attention before can can tell you this can turn against you. And two months later, you can enjoy uh, gems like this. Backlash to Big Bang discovery gathers steam. This is his cast down a landmark experiment's claim to observe gravity waves from the Big Bang. So. That uh, begs the question, did we just mess this one up? Uh, and the concern that's been voiced is that the uh, that our galaxy itself kind of bit polarized microwaves. And uh, in particular, dust can heat up and glow in such a fashion, perhaps that's all we saw. And in principle, you can tell these things apart by mapping the sky different colors, because they have different spectra. And so, in principle, you can tease them apart. It's sort of like how your ear can tell the difference between a, a trumpet and a flute playing the same note. They have different spectra. And the dirty secret behind Bicep 2 is a monochromatic camera just observing at 150 gigahertz, that's where the microwave background is the brightest. So on its own, it's difficult to tell these things apart. And we've had to rely on outside data sets. Now, the original data, the legacy data from BICEP 1, had some sensitivity at 100 gigahertz, and that suggests that what we saw was indeed cosmic, but it's not definitive. The signal to noise was only so-so in that map. Some of the outside data we have relied upon comes from the Planck satellite team. Uh, so this is a map they put out in May at 350 gigahertz, so it's a higher frequency where dust is brighter than CMD. And you can see from this fingerprint pattern on here that it's uh, indeed a polarization map. Uh, conspicuous here, though, is its absence in the, the, in the southern and northern polar regions. The signal to noise is very low in those proportions, and they're dogged by very systematic challenges. Uh, guess where our field lives? All right, let's right there. Right, so it's difficult from this data on its own to say a whole lot about what we've seen. That hasn't stopped some people from taking preliminary releases and, and speculating that maybe it was all dust. Uh, but really, the only way to make progress is to correlate our maps with theirs. That's going on as we speak, actually, we're collaborating. Uh, so we'll know very soon whether there's something to these maps. Uh, we're not holding our breath, though. Uh, when we head back down to the South Pole this year, we're going to be packing some serious heat. Uh, this is bicep <laughs> 3. This is the equivalent of five bicep 2s. They're all 100 gigahertz. So that will provide a second color follow-up. Uh, we're going to take the uh, five cat cameras. Two of them actually have been observing for the past six months at 100 gigahertz, uh, and we're already three to four times, no, more than four times deeper than the original Bicep 1 maps uh, at that color. Uh, we're going to replace two more with cameras that are going to be sensitive to 270 gigahertz, uh, so it should give us direct sensitivity to dust. So you have to stay tuned to see how this shakes out. can't tell you now. I simply want to leave you with uh, this image here. Uh, this is a slide that our late leader, uh, Professor Andrew Lang down at Caltech, used to show in his slides. And uh, I think for many of us, it reflects our sense of excitement and adventure that we feel towards our field. Uh, and it actually, it, it very accurately, albeit poetically, depicts what we do. We, we literally look beyond the stars to understand the inner workings of our universe. But the difference, as Andrew once noted, uh, is that rather than happening in the countryside of France, this is occurring at the edge of the world, at the South Pole. Thank you very much. Do I? Alright. Does anyone have any questions? Sir? Balcony. Sam, what's up? Would they, would they cook a Hot Pocket? <laughs> Pretty damn slowly, three Kelvin. How do you distinguish between the microwave background and the issue? How do you know you're looking at the image? Well, it, so the, uh, so yeah, sorry, the, the question was how, how do you know that you're looking at the edge of the observable universe when you're, when you're looking at the microwave background? And, and the answer is that there's a number of properties that the model predicts 
that, that you would expect to see in the data, and indeed the data is consistent with that. It's a pretty common background, uh, and, um, and it has this uniformity across the sky, as you might expect from inflation. Uh, and uh, so there's, there's a number of benchmarks that we're, we're checking against the theory as we go through there within the data. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to think of the ones that are specific to that, but that's ultimately it is that when we do the analysis, there's many things that I, I didn't share here, because 20 to 25 minutes isn't much time, but, but there's a number of things that we are, are comparing against what you expect from, from other data sets and from, from the, uh, the existing models, and, and indeed they check out, and of course if they didn't, it would be a bigger deal than, than perhaps even this. Uh, they come from the fact that the space itself is sort of teeming with these these vibrations, we suspect. Yeah, sorry, I'll repeat the question. Uh, he was asking where the gravitational waves come from. And, and the, the source is exotic, uh, you know, because you can have binary stars, pairs of stars orbiting one another, and, uh, and they create ripples that one in principle could detect. This is what this experiment, LIGO, and other related ones would want to do. So those are extra-physical sources. Uh, the ones that we're looking at, however, are, are a bit more bizarre. The idea is that space itself on a fine scale is sort of buzzing with this energy. It's a little dump some ripple, ripples popping into another existence. You would never see them except that inflation stretches them rapidly to cosmic scales and freezes them in place. So it's a bizarre mechanism, but that's the idea, right? Right, so the polarization uh, is, is uh, Ooh, switch back to the original slides that were shown. We hadn't tried to do the webcam thing. No, so this is a good question. Uh, and yeah, just go back to the, the other ones that I have there. Third night. And then give me the conk. Ah, uh, we'll just flip on real quick. Let me go to 50. I don't know. Right, so the idea is that as, as the space is being stretched and compressed, you've got heating and cooling on opposite axes, right? And so the, the idea here is that if it's hot and cold on some diagonal axis, so will be the polarization that gets scattered. And what would have been more clear if I just didn't try the webcam thing was that, uh, that if you put the grid in front of here and you rotate it back and forth, you can see it get dim and bright on these opposite axes where the light's coming in from intense directions along the diagonals. Right, and, uh, and the crucial point that we're looking at here is that this, if you were to reflect it, uh, it would go to the opposite diagonal. Right, so this is a little more clear with a nicer camera I had set up in, outside my kitchen there. Uh, and so that, that was the feature we were looking for that hadn't been seen before. So I don't know if that makes it a little more tangible. Mm -hmm. Two more. Anyone else? Yo. Could you start over and explain it like I'm five? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I guess the crucial point is the Cliff Notes more. version. What? Maybe it's just a one more. One more. The, 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 <laughs> the, the, the crucial point, the Cliff Notes version here, is that this, this rapid expansion amplifies all these funny things in space that we can't see because it's too faint, right? It only happened once, we think, in the early universe. Uh, and, uh, and the features that we're looking at here from the gravitational waves produce a, a phenomenon more exotic than things we had seen before. People have been looking for years, haven't seen them yet. Uh, we think we may have seen it this time around. That's my... my... No, 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 nothing funny behind there. What else? Uh, yeah. I consider myself kind of an armchair physicist. I've okay. watched all the Carl Sagan. <laughs> I've watched all the Neil deGrasse Tyson cosmos. Uh, I, you know, I keep up with this and read all these articles. And I'm not going to say I understand everything yet, but a question that I always have, and I don't think ever gets answered, and I don't think it's going to get answered this time. But all these experiments that you do, has anyone figured out what it was that blew up, why it blew up? And if it will ever blow up again, I mean, what what is it? Like? Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, so, I understand all the evidence, but I always have that question: what exploded? 
Well, so the explosion, so it, and the Big Bang is a misnomer. It's, it's actually a terrible terminology. It's, uh, it was in, in, back in the 1950s, there was a debate as to whether it was a Big Bang or just a steady state universe. And people who did not like this idea of an early universe who were annoyed that actually it was a Catholic priest who actually suggested this occurred, who was also a physicist. Uh, and, and so Big Bang was actually a name that was meant to deride the model. So it's not really an explosion at one place. It's sort of meant to be an explosion everywhere. It's supposed to be a state where the universe was at very, very high temperatures, uh, obscenely high temperatures, right? But it was happening everywhere at once. So that's that's the model we have. Uh, and you know, and, and this sort of this figure. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, there we go. All right, so this figure here is, is meant to sort of communicate that, right? That at extremely high temperatures, you have all of these forces presumably acting as the same thing. And so a lot of us speculate that the things that may have driven the Big Bang may ultimately be explained by the relationship between these things, right? This is the, the long-term goal of physics for, you know, for decades and probably for decades to come. Now, in terms of whether this occurs again or not, right, like that's that's really the whole point of this this business with the ecbotic model that I was talking about, right? Like this guy has speculated maybe it continues to expand forever, as as other people suggested, or he says maybe it recollapses into, into the same thing and repeats over and over again, right? And the fact that we measure these gravitational waves, or at least we, we may have measured these gravitational waves, so it puts pressure on the idea that uh, that this would occur over and over again because the model that was constructed to suggest such a thing really doesn't leave a lot of room for these things to exist at these sort of sort of magnitudes. So it could happen again, but the data suggests perhaps not. We want to have one more. There's an enthusiastic woman there in the balcony. All right, balcony. All right. Enthusiastic woman. Well, enthusiastic woman. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering about the figure where you show like the four forces kind of bifurcating. Yeah. Um, is there an empirical evidence for, or somewhere we can measure when that would have happened, or are those all the products of theory, of, of you know, of applying theory? So these two, that is on fairly firm footing because that temperature has been achieved with accelerators over at the large hadron collider, right? So that that there's a consensus that indeed these had a relationship that's sort of reflected by this figure, and the Higgs boson discovery that was the people made a big deal about a couple of years ago was was the the, the last piece of that whole that whole quest. Um, higher up, it becomes more speculative, right? This is a temperature a trillion times hotter than down here, and uh, and so you know, we can't make that on our planet, right? We would tax the resources of our planet, perhaps to construct just an experiment, right? But we can look for cosmic signatures of it. Um, but yeah, this from here on it, it becomes increasingly speculative, uh, and the relationship between gravity and these guys is uh, is uh, well. It's very challenging, uh, and it's there, the people who work on these things are hard pressed to predict things we might measure. So the answer is yes, and uh, as you go up. <laughs> so thank you, Roger. If people want to come play with this thing, I'll leave this thing up for the time being, and people can stir around with it, and maybe you'll learn something. <laughs> And if you have additional questions for Roger, he'll be over in theater two. Uh, we'll be back in about ten minutes with a we'll talk about open R
robots that do stuff. Um, I just want to say I really enjoyed that currency talk. I enjoy, I'm enjoying all of our talks tonight. I think they're awesome. Um, prior to um, Scott's intro and Jeremy's talk, everything I knew about currency was from that one DuckTales episode with the bottle caps, so that was awesome. Okay, let's talk about citizen science. <laughs> so, not everybody is going to build robots that go underwater and do awesome stuff, right? But there's many ways that we as residents of the Bay Area um, can participate in scientific research and um, help out in whatever way we can. So I thought it would be really interesting to talk about the ways we can all science. Yes, even you. Um, so there are many awesome science organizations around the Bay Area, and if you visit their websites, it's really easy to find this stuff. Uh, but I thought I'd get you guys started with a few ideas. Um, for example, we have California Academy of Sciences. Um, they're looking for people who are willing to document the biodiversity that they observe in the Bay Area. Uh, this is just a screenshot of their website. Um, we also have Chabot. Um, they're doing. They're involved in this project about the coastal redwoods and how the habitat of the coastal redwood is changing due to climate change. Um, so you, as someone who lives in the area, can uh, very easily uh, contribute your observations. Um, if you don't even want to get that involved, there's even easier stuff you can do. Like if you see an otter, <laughs> you see a river otter, you can take note of that, and it's really helpful because. People are trying to track river otters and their behaviors and what they're up to. Um, and I particularly liked this one um, because it's the Bay Area Frog Watch chapter. I didn't know we had a Frog Watch chapter, so it's just, just some neat ideas. If you want to be a citizen scientist, you don't have to start from scratch and build your own robots. You can. I encourage you to. But if you're not quite up for that, there are so many opportunities to add your own observations to this sort of crowdsourced science project. Um, and you can really help out that way. Um, so to talk more about citizen science and open ROV and underwater robots, we have David Lang. Okay, thank you very much. Um, theater, theater two, can you hear me? Okay. They're on a delay. They're on a delay? Yeah. All right. Um, we don't want you to curse. <laughs> Just no, it's all right. It's all right. Um, that was an awesome introduction. I wasn't expecting that. And it actually works perfectly for a lot of the stuff uh, that I want to talk about. Um, the first thing I want to do is I was giving a talk uh, a month ago. And I went through the whole talk, and I was telling good stories, and there were people who were looking at me just like you're looking at me and nodding and smiling. And then at, at the end of the talk, the first question, somebody raises their hand in the back and goes, so what's an open ROV? And I just had like, gone through this whole talk and not even explained actually what an open ROV is or what the underwater robot is. So I never want to make that mistake again. I felt like a knucklehead. So that's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to start off, is just telling you what uh, an open ROV is. So that's an open ROV. This is an open ROV here. Um, and very simply, it's an underwater robot. So it's got a camera and it's got lights, LEDs, it's got thrusters, which are these brushless motors here, it's got propellers, it's got batteries on board, and you can drive it around and see what it's seeing. So this is a, a shot from Lake Tahoe with an ROV that's underwater looking at a, a old sunken sailboat and we're all up on a uh, boat with a little laptop and we're able to see um, what the underwater robot can see. And so that is what it is. That's the what of open ROV. And now I want to go and tell you the why. And the why is a little bit more fun. So it starts, like all good stories, with uh, sunken treasure. Uh, I met my friend Eric Stackpole about three and a half years ago. And he, does it, I don't know if any, a few people know Eric, but it, as soon as I 
and met him, he launched into this crazy story about treasure up in the Sierras and how there was a, a gold mining operation and there was a gold rush and the gold was taken and thrown in this underwater cave and there was this whole elaborate story about cave divers and treasure hunters who had all gone after this gold and no one had been able to find it. And Eric was building an underwater robot to go and explore this cave and he showed me this little underwater robot he put it on the table and I thought, wow, that is pretty cool. And I wanted to be a part of it and I wanted to, to help out and I just thought this was the, the coolest thing. And so Eric is an engineer, I'm not an engineer, I'm also not a scientist, so um, going back to the, to the introduction, um, we did, he, we had this initial prototype, but we really didn't know what we were doing, this thing didn't work, um, there was a lot of problems uh, with, with our plan, for sure, uh, but we did have the internet, and so what I kind of convinced Eric to do was I said, you know what we should do? is we should just put our big idea of having this low-cost underwater robot, we should put that online. And we should say, you know, this is an open source project. If anyone wants to come and help, we welcome your contributions. And so we put, we put up this website, openrov.com, and started talking about it. And for a year, it was just me and Eric on the forums. Just me asking him really basic questions about physics and buoyancy and all this stuff. But slowly and surely we got other people, I think just because they took pity on us, they started contributing and giving us ideas and saying, well, you should actually just think about this. This is how everybody else does it. And so it slowly began accumulating uh, and we just wouldn't stop talking about this cave. We were gonna go explore this cave. And so we actually did that. Uh, we kind of mounted this makeshift expedition with a group of our friends and went up to go, to go explore this underwater cave. And sure enough, there was this underwater portion and we went down, we set the robot down and that became actually a big deal. Uh, the New York Times wrote about it and then all of a sudden we had so many people on our website and so many people saying, hey, I want an underwater robot to explore blank. And oh, we got all of these wonderful messages. And so what we did is we decided to put our project on Kickstarter. And again, we didn't really know what we were doing, but we did it anyways. And we set this a goal of raising $20,000. And we raised that in about two hours, which is really exciting. And, for, and on Kickstarter two years ago, that was a lot of money. Now it's like, that happens every hour on Kickstarter. But you know, two years ago, it was a big deal. And so you push this button and your project is live and you see, see the money going up and you're high-fiving and it's a lot of fun. And then it just keeps going up and you're thinking, oh my God, we really gotta make these things. <laughs> and so we were uh, basically offering these kits and we thought, oh, well, that's not a big deal. I mean, we'll just put these kits together and we'll ship them out to all our backers. That's, you know, that's manageable. And, and you think that's manageable until the boxes start showing up at your garage and you realize the magnitude of what you've done. <laughs> and that you have to build all these things and do all these things. And um, <laughs> Eric was leaving to go to Antarctica to, for a job for three months. So I was stuck in a garage trying to sort all this stuff out. Um, it was really hard. Uh, but, but thanks to Zach and, and others, we, uh, we actually got it done. And we built these ROVs and we, we shipped all, all the kits. And, you know, here we are, these things have now been all over the place. You know, this is Florida, this is in Cenotes in Mexico, this is in Antarctica. Uh, I, someone sent me this last week. This is from Cuba. This is a silky shark. She, she didn't send me a video, she just showed me this. She just sent the screenshot, no messages. Um, but, so that's what I, they're all over the place. And so this is a, an, an old slide of all the people who, are in our, who have joined our community. And it's in over 50 countries, it's thousands of people. It's a really cool thing to be a part of. It's a really positive group, and it's a really, I think, optimistic and exciting and smart group. And we've created a cool little tool. And I snapped this photo in the airport because I thought it was really interesting. Um, because it was you know, two guys, three ROVs, and it was all carry-on luggage. And, and for you guys just hearing my story, you think, of course, yeah, it's all carry-on luggage. But I, sh I showed this photo at an at a ocean exploration conference with leaders from Woods Hole 
scripts and Noah and all that stuff. And this slide, like, their jaws were on the floor because they're so used to these really, really expensive tools and they have to get cargo containers and expensive ship time. And we were just a, some kids out of the garage with these robots in our backpack. And it's, this is actually a really big deal uh, for ocean exploration, for exploration in general. And it's not just us. Um, you know, the things that are going into this are the maker movement is what's driving a lot of this. So these digital fabrication tools like 3D printers and laser cutters and places, maker spaces like Tech Shop and Ace Monster Toys and all these things are creating you know, these building blocks for people to make just about anything. And people like us are making underwater robots and drones and all this stuff. But, you know, it's all of, everyone's got a phone in their pocket. All those components are getting really, really cheap. And people are reconfiguring them in interesting ways. And so this is another oceanographic tool. Uh, but this is kind of where I'm at now, is I've been thinking a lot about this idea, about what this means. It's like, okay, yeah, we can make these tools. But I think the next step is something that's even more exciting and even more interesting. And that there are all of these, these tools that are out there, and all these people are coming together and kind of working together to build these things, but also to plot these little expeditions like we did to the cave. And I've been calling this kind of thing citizen exploration or connected exploration. And this is a photo of uh, John Dobson, who was a, uh, passed away earlier this year, and he's a, he was a, vin a monk who started making his own telescopes. And just was obsessed with building telescopes and getting people to go outside and look and look up and see, and see the moon and see the stars and and he spent his whole life building telescopes from scratch and then standing on the corners of, of San Francisco and every night just showing people um, the skies and he's one of my big heroes because his Dobsonian telescope the the telescope that he designed became this this tool for amateurs to see into these deeper catalogs. And it's, it's now to the point where, where amateurs are, are making really significant contributions to uh, the field of astronomy. So that's why I have this picture there. And so this, this is a photo of uh, my friend Chris Anderson. Um, so some people know Chris? All right. He's, uh, he's a great guy, but he, He's also uh, got a pretty interesting story. So when he took this photo, he was the editor-in-chief of Wired Magazine. But he, on, on the weekend, he had, was flying one of these remote control uh, planes with his kids and also playing with Lego Mindstorms and kind of realized that he could make a low-cost autopilot. And so he started this website called DIY Drones, which was really a model for Eric and I when we got started. And he and his whole community started building these open source autopilots. And that was really the basis, kind of one of the one of the kickstarting moments for all of these drones that you guys now see everywhere. And these things have become ubiquitous. And so that kind of weekend with his with his kids has turned into this big company called 3D Robotics. They make and manufacture thousands and thousands of these drones and they're in all sorts of uh, devices. Uh, but they're also being used for conservation. You know, this, this type of thing is being used in Indonesia and Africa um, to combat poachers, and, and people are even using this in ocean conservation to um, find illegal fishing vessels. And I was just talking to a guy last week who's a volunteer with NOAA who goes out, and, and if he gets a report of a whale who's caught up in uh, crab, crab traps, then he goes out and he said, yeah, I want to get a drone just so I can go out and find these whales because sometimes it's very hard to do. So all of a sudden these tools are not just kind of hobbyist, um, game, hobbyist toys anymore. They're actually serious tools for people to go out and understand our world and protect our planet, which is really cool. Um, this is another story uh, like that. This is a, a group of guys in the exact same garage that I that I put up before our garage. So these were Eric's roommates, um, Robbie and Will and, and a few other guys, and they thought they could make a cheaper satellite than what NASA was doing. And they were looking at all these same same factors and components that are going into cell phones. They thought, you know, I think we could do this for a little bit cheaper. We could do this a little bit better. And so what they did is exactly that. And they started making a satellite in this garage. 
and they've since made several satellites and they've launched I think this was you know they've been doing this for the past three three years or so they've since launched I think already 70 satellites and Planet Labs is now the name of their company and they're running a space program out of an office building in San Francisco and their constellation of doves is what they call them are going to get an image of every location on the planet every day we've never had that um, in our world and that's really it's really exciting and that came out of the same garage that we started making these underwater robots in so it's not it's not a, f a far away thing that some geniuses they are geniuses but it's not a far away thing I mean this is something that's happening in your neighborhood in your city it's pretty cool and so this is, these are the images that they're getting back this one they got last week and I wanted to put this one up there because they got this image about 10 minutes after this wildfire was reported and this is just an example of the way that we're going to be monitoring our planet in, in totally new ways and the same thing goes for illegal fishing and forestry and, and there's an infinite number of ways that this stuff can be useful and again I think this kind of gets back to this idea of connected exploration so we're gonna have these cheap low-cost tools and then we're gonna have these ways that everyone can under understand our world and, and our environment in a, in a way that we haven't before and so I've been trying to explain this in a, in a bunch of different ways and people are, people always want to jump into this idea about citizen science and I think it's a really cool idea. I love citizen science. Um, but I think that's a really small sliver of what's happening. Like so, so far I've been to the citizen science meeting, summit, whatever it is in London earlier this year. And all they could talk about was how are we gonna get amateurs cited on papers. And I was thinking, I don't care about getting cited on a paper. This is, for me, this is about the thrill of adventure. I wanna go and explore and, and discover. And I think that is a more important thing to note is that this isn't about just getting your name on a, on a paper because for a lot of people that doesn't matter what this is about is about building new tools to help you go further to make your life richer and to and to know to know to have a question and to go out and pursue the answer and so for me this is amateur curiosity that's the cool thing and that is actually what this this is about is all of these new tools are fuel on that fire and so you know if you want to go out and you want to participate um, in any of those citizen science um, projects that got put up earlier I encourage you to do it because you're going to meet some great people and it's going to be really helpful um, for the science that those institutions or people are doing but I also want to encourage you to think broader than that and to understand that you have all these new tools and resources at your disposal that you can with a group of friends you know go look for lost treasure and who knows where that's going to lead um, we certainly didn't know uh, and so you know all these things have been going on and we uh, continue we're continually pushing the boundaries like okay so we were able to do that well let's try and do this and you know we're always trying to push it and so we thought okay well Craig Venture sailed around the world and did all this metagenomic sampling what if we used our tools and some of these other low-cost DIY bio tools and went and tried to um, do the same thing so we plotted this whole expedition um, and it kind of, I guess it was kind of an adventure um, to the Sea of Cortez uh, earlier this year and you know, we had a bunch of you know smart people, but no one um, who no one was who was affiliated with any kind of a university. And you know, we mapped it out. This is our site called Open Explorer, where you can see kind of all these DIY adventures that people are putting together. Um, and it was a disaster. Um, it, not a total disaster, uh, but you know, we ran into all sorts of interesting problems. And one of the big ones is that you need permits to do this stuff um, and like expensive permits and six months of paperwork and the kind of thing that you yeah, you have to like apply for a grant and do all this stuff I mean we didn't need the money to do it we just needed the permission and we were just we wanted to take water samples 
but it turns out that you can't take a water sample um, in, in Mexico. You can take a big fish, like a big part of the ecosystem, but you can't just take a little water sample, which is interesting. Um, so we didn't want to get arrested for biopiracy in Mexico. And so we just decided this would be kind of a trial run just to test our tools. And we did learn a lot. And I think, you know, if we go back, we'll, um, you know, jump through the appropriate hoops and, and, and go through with it. But that was a really important learning experience because we bumped up against all of these kind of administrative hurdles of, of what's going to stand in the way from, from these amateurs and people with questions and actually going out and finding those answers. And it, frankly, a lot of those rules are in place for, for a lot of good reasons, too. So it's an interesting discussion. This is also happening. So I found out, as soon as we got back, I found out about this thing called Ocean Sampling Day. And this was started by a group of researchers in Germany or the Netherlands or both, I can't remember. And they wanted to get a bunch of people out, a bunch of researchers out, to take a metagenomic samples of all the all these different places around the globe on the same day. And they had put together this ocean sampling day handbook that had almost all the information that I needed before we went to the Sea Cortez. Like that took, took me like a lot of research to to figure out everything we were, wanted to do. And they had put it together in this packet. And they put together this thing, well, all you have to do is give this to the munis municipalities that you're that you're operating in and this will be a, like a waiver for you guys to have permits. And it's like they, so, you know, here's one end, there's these amateurs, us, coming and being more curious and seeing what we can do. And on the other end, there are these researchers who are providing these tools and resources to make it easier for people like us. So the way, and they also made an app, so you can like, just take your sample, it has all these things, you mail it into the, to the, the sequencing places that they'd already set up, you know, they already have these relationships. And so here are these researchers coming at it from a totally different perspective. And they were inundated with all of these citizen scientists who wanted to participate in that. That really surprised them. And so the way that we've started talking about it is that the maker movement and the traditional kind of science world are on a collision course. And it's going to be really interesting to see how it all plays out. This is, this is a, um, a site that was made by uh, the digital, oh wait, it's the Ocean Networks Canada, which is a big, huge funded thing where these scientists are creating this really interesting ocean observation network. And they put up this citizen science uh, component to their site. And I love this first line. We're looking for a few hundred thousand volunteers. <laughs> it's a, so audacious. Um, but I, so, you know, they're trying to get all these, these things going where they want people to participate and identify the fish for their observation network. And I don't know where they're going to get them, honestly. Um, I'd love to hear more about how that's going, but that's such an ambitious ask. I don't know how they're going to do it. And on the, on the flip side, I'm part of this group on Facebook called the, the ID Please Marine Creature Identification Group. And it's run by this, this girl named Katie. She's a German living in this island called Romblon Island in, in the South Pacific. And she's a diver, and she just started po posting photos and asking people to help identify um, what, what she was seeing. And this group is fantastic. If you put a photo up here from uh, a dive or, or anything, they'll identify it in seconds. I mean, this group is, you know, it's got 3,000 members, but they're super active. And um, I, I've actually talked to marine biologists who actually use this group. And if they're out in the field and they don't know what something is, they actually go to this Facebook group because they've just become so fantastic. So to me, that this is the same thing, right? We have these big organizations, these big institutions who need this kind of help. And we have these amateurs and these people who are just excited and interested who uh, are trying to, you know, who want to do it anyway. So I think there's a, I think that we're going to continue to see that. And then this is just a, a clip. So we, we launched this site, Open Explorer, I mentioned it before, but we just launched it um, basically a week ago. And we just started posting and saying, hey, um, if you know, what do you want to explore, was the question. You know, what are you curious about? And in the week, we've already gotten, you know, over 50 people who have these really awesome expedition ideas or, you know, project ideas, the things they, they want to go explore. Uh, there's the, this, these sunken caves in northern Wales that, I mean, the photos from these, these guys have been up there is fantastic, and they want to get an open ROV so they can put it in their backpack and actually get into the 
these mines and go down and explore what's what's in the sunken portions, which is so cool. Um, and these are, are sh shipwrecks in um, Slovenia, uh, these in the Adriatic Sea. This is a this is in San Francisco. This is a butterfly uh, corridor. There's these this group called Nature in the City, which is fantastic. You should all check them out. They build. Um, uh, habitat for uh, native butterflies that are basically saving species that are that are going extinct. They're an amazing group. Uh, and this is uh, one I saw today, which is a woman who wants to go to the Salton Sea in Southern California and actually go down and explore and see what's going on there, because very few people actually go in and check it out. So um, all of this stuff is just popping up. When you ask people, uh, what they're curious about and what they're interested in. Uh, it's a very different question than here, just come participate in my citizen science study and take samples and do all these things. And I think we need to get to that question. So what, are you, what are you excited about? What are you interested in? And I'm really curious to hear what all of you have to say to that question. And I also invite you to take part in this because I think it's really exciting. So, thank you. Thank you. Questions? Did you find <laughs> this is the other one that I always forget to. So the, the question is, did you find any treasure in the cave? And this is uh, this is always the first question. And we didn't. We didn't. But we. I always say that the treasure was all these people that we met. Is it wireless? So the, the question is: Is the ROV wireless? And this is it, so it's not. It's got a it's got a hundred meter tether. So it's a very thin two wire tether. I, I cut it off of this one, but you can see it's very thin, and it goes down to a hundred meters, and that's the, the depth limit of the ROV. Well, you could. I mean, yeah, we've done that. But you can't control it from underwater. You have to control it from the surface. The balcony. So, uh, how many thousands of people have said we will? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, it's great that there's a thousand, thousands of people. How do we get this uh, to be millions of people? And I think that's a really good question. And so I, I, I love the idea of millions of people who are doing whatever it is. If, the, if it's butterfly corridors, if it's who are thinking up their own kind of expedition or adventure or question or or whatever it is i i don't know how we get there but i but i one one thing i i'm pretty certain of is that it's not going to be me telling someone here's the idea here's how we're going to do it uh and here's how everybody can participate in that i think the answer to that is just continuing to hammer this message that, yeah, it's not, my ideas aren't the best ideas. It, it's this idea that all of a sudden we have these tools where we can have these, these I, I think it's a richer life. When Eric and I started this, we, we always talked about maximizing our return on adventure. And that's what, we, you know, I, get, I got two emails today from people who were like, hey, David, I, there's a shipwreck in Maine in this lake, and we're going to get some people together. Can you come? And I got another email from a friend saying, hey, David, we're going to do a motorcycle trip to the headwaters of the Nile to explore that. Like, that's amazing. And I, and I don't think that's just unique to me. I think that's a situation that is... We don't have to just watch National Geographic anymore and go, wow, that looks cool. We can say, actually, why don't we just get some friends together and go you know, do some research on some history of this, these places and, and learn about it and dig deeper. And, and I don't know. That's how I think it gets to millions, is, is more people kind of wake up to this idea that you don't have to be a passive kind of consumer of adventure and curiosity. 
that that seemed like a right as a human to, to try and understand our world. Does that answer your question? Any more questions? Is that? Can I not? One more question? But that was a good end. All right, we can end it. <laughs> <have another. laughs> Uh, thanks to David, thanks to all of you and our speakers. It was an awesome night. Thanks to the Oakland Public Library, as well as the New Parkway. I just wanted to touch with a few more things. Upcoming events. Uh, there's a bone cleaning class this week. Uh, the bone room is pretty awesome. Uh, eventually there may be a Nerd Night field trip there, but... Uh, <laughs> There's still an opportunity to like apply to like go to that uh, in front of us. Uh, Wonderfest and Ask a Scientist are awesome. They're having an event at Chabot. Uh, I rarely talk to you about what I do. I hope that I only delve into metallurgy, you know, once every other month or so. Uh, I'm going to give a talk to the American Society of Metals in Mountain View. Uh, feel free to check it out. There's dinner involved, so that's good. Uh, iGEM Revolution. Uh, iGEM is the International uh, Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. So we had Terry Johnson talk about that a few months ago. Uh, there's going to be a, a larger talk about what this means in the future of humanity uh, for the Long Now Foundation at SF Jazz. Nerd Night San Francisco is this month. But next week, next week here, or sorry, next month, September 29th, we have uh, our own librarian, Sharon McKellar, who uh, some, someone should take a picture because Sharon like follows us on social media. She's going to talk to us about picture books. She's on the Caldecott Committee, so this uh, talk is going to be fantastic. Kelly Wienersmith, who runs uh, the podcast, The Weekly Wienersmith, as well as Science Sort of, is going to talk to us about parasites that make creatures into zombies, and we'll have live specimens. Uh, they, they won't turn you into zombies, I promise. Uh, and then Matthew Lewin from uh, Cal Academy will talk about creating an antidote for snake bite. So hope to see you then. Uh, thanks for coming. Bye.